Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from the bunker and in this video we simply must talk about the October 2020 JW Broadcasting episode hosted by Governing Body member Jeffrey Jackson in which a few things were said that I want to talk about so without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Most of us have faced temptations involving fleshly desires. It may have been temptations to commit immorality or temptations that appealed to greed or an unbalanced concern about material things. Other temptations may have appealed to our pride or tested our humility or our desire to impress others. And who of us hasn't been tempted by opportunities offered to us by Satan's world for wealth, power, or position. No matter what temptation comes our way, though, remember Jesus' words, pray continually so that you may not enter into temptation. I have two problems with this, really. First of all, you have the way Jehovah's Witnesses continue to be guilt-tripped over things like money and relationships. You saw there some clips from an earlier dramatization in which a young Jehovah's Witness falls in love at school and ends up being disciplined simply for getting into a consenting relationship. They can talk about morality if they want, but in the context of an organization that's under scrutiny for its child protection policies, which effectively enable some of the worst of mankind to go unpunished, putting children at risk. That's my idea of immorality. Two young people being in a consenting relationship isn't my idea of immorality. And I certainly don't see anything wrong with people beautifying their homes. I mean, how would this footage stack up against footage of the accommodation for the governing body members? If we could see that, of course, we're never going to see it. But if we could peer into the accommodation of Tony Morris, of Stephen Lett, of Jeffrey Jackson, how would their accommodation at the Warwick headquarters compare with what they are portraying here as opulent living <laughs> just because someone has exchanged their old TV for a large flat screen. Apparently, if you do that, we heard about this, of course, at the Always Rejoice convention. <laughs> if you get a 60-inch flat screen, you'd better be putting in a shift for Jehovah. You'd better be justifying it or able to justify it because you've been going above and beyond in serving Jehovah. You can't just go and get a flat screen if you haven't been doing enough for Jehovah's organization or putting the kingdom first. All of this amounts to micromanaging people's lives, making people feel guilty simply for enjoying life. There is nothing wrong, by the way, with enjoying life. This is part of the culture when you're growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. The outside world is stigmatized as being purely about enjoying life in Satan's system of things. What's the opposite of enjoying life? Not enjoying life. And when you don't enjoy life, well, you're at risk, aren't you, of ending it, ultimately. This is an organization that makes you feel guilty just for enjoying life, just for getting some happiness in our brief time on this planet. Uh, I also find it incredibly hypocritical for Jeffrey Jackson to be saying, who of us hasn't been tempted by opportunities offered to us by Satan's world for wealth, power or position? And who of us hasn't been tempted by opportunities offered to us by Satan's world for wealth, power or position? Apparently, Jeffrey Jackson and his colleagues are the only ones who are allowed to enjoy 
well, wealth is arguable because we don't have any transparency when it comes to their finances. Although we know in at least the case of Tony Morris that there's enough money to do a trip to Bottle King. <laughs> but power and position, apparently the governing body are the only ones on the planet who get to aspire to power and position. Let's examine another example of how Satan returned to Jesus. This time, it was by means of the religious leaders. They attacked Jesus verbally, misquoting scripture and hurling senseless accusations at him. But Jesus understood what they were up to and frankly told them, you are from your father, the devil. We shouldn't be surprised if apostates and other opposers use similar tactics today. Just as Jesus was accused of blasphemy and political sedition, so too God's people have been labelled as extremists and have been the victims of all sorts of false accusations. Like Jesus, we remember who really is behind all these attacks. Satan, the great tempter. This is interesting for me right at the moment in the context of Watchtower pursuing me over claims of hate speech. They seem to have this tactic or this strategy of conflating any criticism of the organisation whatsoever with, oh, look at what's happening in Russia. You cannot criticise the governing body, apparently, without making yourself in league with Putin, without suggesting that witnesses in Russia deserve to be tortured and incarcerated and otherwise oppressed purely for what's going on in their minds. Again, I guess you have to see more of the substance of what they've been accusing me of, and this will be revealed in future episodes of my hate speech series, but they pull the same trick with me. They suggest that because I'm criticising the governing body, because I'm pointing out the fallacies, the bad arguments, the efforts at manipulation, therefore I'm persecuting and oppressing Jehovah's Witnesses and doing pretty much what's being done at the moment in Russia, even though I've been vocal against the ban on Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. We're going to see more of this ridiculous fear-mongering and stigmatization of apostates elsewhere in this episode, and I just find it fascinating that Watchtower can't see how ultimately counterproductive this is, because the more they jump up and down about apostates, the more they say ridiculous things about them and portray them as these evil conniving villains the more they mention apostates it's just basic psychology that jehovah's witnesses are going to think hang on is there something the apostates are saying that's actually true is there something i'm not supposed to hear because it debunks my beliefs maybe i should see for myself what these apostates are saying that's so terrible, because if it's half as terrible as Jeffrey Jackson and others are making out, it will become immediately obvious within just a few seconds of watching an apostate YouTube video, ah, yeah, I get it, they're in league with Putin, they like to see Jehovah's Witnesses being tortured, etc., etc. But of course, if they do go on YouTube, that's not what they're going to find, at least on this channel. So far we've discussed how we could enter into temptation to do something wrong. However, we may also be tempted not to do something right. For example, although we know that we should forgive another person for something they have done against us, perhaps we may enter into the temptation of avoiding that person and not forgiving them, even though there may be a basis for doing so. What can help us in such a situation? Again, the answer is, pray for Jehovah's help. This is the theme of our music video for this month. It involves a very painful situation between a mother and a daughter. 
let's see the role of prayer in starting to resolve what might seem to be an impossible problem. I perhaps should have warned you that this is the most disturbing part of this month's broadcast. If you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness, maybe you're watching this channel for the first time, you might be thinking, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with encouraging Christians to forgive freely? That's what Christianity is all about. Someone does something, they say sorry, and you extend forgiveness. There was that famous verse, how many times should I forgive my brother? Is it seven times? And Jesus says, no, 77 times. Forgiveness is key in the Christian religion. But when you listen to this song, or watch this video even, in the context of child protection, it takes on a whole different meaning and you start to see why it's so problematic for there to be such an onus on the sin of CSA, and I'm being careful due to demonetization, the sin of CSA versus its criminality. If something is a sin, then you can be forgiven of it. You can be repentant. And it's not just about you, it's not just about your repentance and your relationship with God. Your victim has got to forgive you, forgive and forget, and pretend it never happened. In this particular video, it seems that we are seeing some sort of portrayal of a family breakdown, maybe the mother is guilty of adultery and ends up leaving the family home and then years later when her daughter is older she meets with the elders, gets reinstated and the daughter must forgive the mother who we assume devastated the family in some way through her actions. That seems to be the narrative of the video but exactly the same forgiveness is expected of someone who commits the sin of CSA. In that context, let's just revisit some of these lyrics. Forgiveness means you don't bring it back up, or as she sings it, you don't bring it back up. <laughs> This only gets me in a root. This only gets me in a rut, I think she means. Forgiveness means you don't bring it back up. This only gets me in a rut. Really bizarre.
bizarre way of singing. I find it so distracting. Anyway, you're not allowed to bring it back up. This only gets me in a rut. You're in a rut if you can't move on and forget. It's right about now that I have to pray. Jehovah saw what happened. Jehovah saw what happened. He knows my pain. It's okay so long as Jehovah saw what happened. You can see where that thinking can lead. As long as Jehovah saw what happened, as long as it's being dealt with spiritually, we don't need to worry about involving the authorities. Honestly, everyone investigating Jehovah's Witnesses, including Ixa, including whoever, they need to see this music video because this perfectly demonstrates the culture of forgiveness inside the Jehovah's Witness religion and what victims are up against. Not only do they have to cope with their abuse being covered up in case after case, but to add insult to injury, they have to forgive and forget. They have to be willing to forgive freely and embrace their abuser. When I attended my first meeting, I saw how humble and caring the witnesses were. I needed to leave martial arts. I had to quit my job as a bodyguard and stop carrying guns. Doing his will wasn't always easy, but Jehovah gave me the courage to do so. My boss asked me to visit him. He offered me a new car and double my salary. His offer was very tempting. So I went to the washroom and intensely prayed again to Jehovah for courage. Jehovah, help me please, I said. I can't do this on my own. In the end, I chose Jehovah. Jehovah is more precious to me than anything this world could offer. I told him, Sorry, but I'm not accepting your offer. It felt like losing a family and death. Eventually, I got baptized. I realized that it didn't matter what people thought about me. It's how Jehovah sees me that matters. Now, I am very grateful to be with the brothers in serving Jehovah. I am now serving as a regular pioneer. And this is the life that I had been looking for. This guy was genuinely torn over his decision. His offer was very tempting. It felt like losing a family and death. And he only turned down this opportunity, it seems, because he'd been manipulated by a religion to feel that if he did this job of being a bodyguard, this would make him a terrible person who would be in line for destruction at Armageddon. In other words, it wasn't really his decision, was it? It was a decision that had been taken for him by the group he was joining. Perhaps it's a country where there are lots of kidnappings, where there's very little security, and maybe in that country bodyguards are legitimately in high demand. But because of the demands placed on him by the religion he was joining, and it's worth remembering that he hadn't even been baptised at the point he turned down this opportunity. Because of these pressures being exerted on him, 
he didn't even have the freedom to make a decision about his own career, about his own employment. The decision had been made for him. And it's worth noting that it's not just about employment. He says, I needed to leave martial arts. And it depicts him putting trophies in the trash. You're not even allowed to pursue martial arts as a sport. And I hope anyone watching this video who doesn't know much about Jehovah's Witnesses can get some idea of the levels of control in this religion and the extent to which almost every facet of one's life gets micromanaged. I am limited in what I can do, but I can still pray. In my prayers, I mention the name of those in my congregation and my personal friends. I make a list of their names so as not to forget anyone. Through JW.org, I read about the brothers in Russia being arrested and the situation in Eritrea. So I make sure to include them in my prayers. The governing body and its helpers, those in full-time service, also need Jehovah's support. Jehovah is without a doubt the hearer of prayer. When I was the only elder in the congregation, or when my wife was sick in bed, he listened to my prayers. So I am confident prayers that I offer will help my fellow friends. Now, I do what I can in service, such as witnessing to caregivers. When I meet those whom I have not seen for a long time and tell them, I've been praying for you, they often tell me how it has really helped them. Some even shed tears out of gratitude. I feel happy too. Although I'm getting physically weaker every day, my prayers are becoming more and more meaningful. I want to cherish this precious gift of prayer that Jehovah has given us as long as I live. Takashi could easily dwell on all the things he can't do. Instead, he focuses on his brothers and sisters. He prays for them every day. And they're not generic prayers. He makes lists so that he doesn't miss anyone. And he goes to jw.org to learn about our brothers in need. Don't get me wrong, Takashi seems like a lovely chap. But what we have here is yet another cookie-cutter, heart-tugging, emotionally manipulative tear-jerking testimonial intended to manipulate the audience, in this case, manipulate the audience into believing that it's a good thing to exhaust your life in service of Jehovah. These testimonials are always difficult to watch, but especially when we're seeing older witnesses who've exhausted their entire lives reading decades worth of literature saying, the end is coming, the end is coming, the end is just around the corner, it's going to be here any moment. There has been this urgency and they've assumed paradise is going to be here any moment, not knowing that they're being lied to. And because of the sunk cost fallacy, they just keep going and going and going because subconsciously what's happening is they're thinking, well, I've invested this much of my life. I've reached the point where I can't afford to be wrong because if I'm wrong, if I've been lied to, then I've wasted all of these decades in the organization. So testimonials like this always disturb me. I also find it interesting that Watchtower here seems to be endorsing Takashi's system of keeping a prayer list, <laughs> a list of everyone he can think of, everyone he knows, presumably the names of the governing body are on that list, but he'll have presumably dozens of names 
on this list so that when he's doing his prayers, he'll open up this book and he'll jog his memory. <laughs> the purpose being, as we heard, so that he doesn't miss anyone. He makes lists so that he doesn't miss anyone. What does it say about Jehovah if he is so petty and pedantic that he will refuse to bless someone just because their name wasn't read out from the list on a certain day? Are we really expected to believe that that's how prayer works? And that's the sort of God we should be worshipping. Someone who's literally there in heaven saying, um, Oh, oh, you forgot Alan. You didn't mention Alan in today's prayer. I'm not going to bless Alan today. Seriously, even if you believe in prayer, even if you believe, and I'm sure many of you watching do, even if you believe that God is in heaven listening to prayers and answering prayers, and I have problems with that whole concept for reasons I've gone into at length in previous episodes. Even if you believe in all of that, what does it say about God if that's the sort of God he is? Where people need to use lists so that they don't forget to ask God to bless someone, otherwise he won't bless them. Second Timothy chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 3 and 4 and talk for a few moments about our being soldiers. 2 Timothy 2, 3, As I find soldier of Christ Jesus, take your part in suffering adversity. No man serving as a soldier involves himself in the commercial businesses of life in order to gain the approval of the one who enrolled him as a soldier. Now, we become soldiers of Christ when we accept Jehovah's arrangements for salvation through Christ Jesus, and we dedicate our lives to him unreservedly for our entire life. We become a soldier. And like a soldier, we know that it's not going to be easy. There are going to be hardships and trials. And yet a fine soldier, his main objective is to stay loyal to his commanding officers and to those who are giving instructions. Now, another aspect of soldiers are that they are identified by their distinctive uniforms or their particular fighting equipment. And that's why it helps to identify who's the friend and who's the foe in the middle of the battle. Their appearance makes that possible. Well, today, there is a clear difference, isn't there, between the soldiers of Satan and the soldiers of Christ. There's great enmity, but there's a sharp contrast in appearance and attitude and disposition and motivation and conduct. And that's why when we think about that, we think about the contrast between the works of the flesh described in Galatians chapter 5 and those who have the fruitage of God's Spirit. There is such a strong distinction between one serving God and one not serving Him. And uh, there can be no gray area here. We're either on one side or the other, correct? For example, suppose that you're a soldier and you're on guard duty, and it's evening, and you see someone approaching, and you cry out, Halt! Who goes there? Friend or foe? And you hear back, I'm both. <laughs> There's an enemy. <laughs> you can't be on both sides. Usually I find Harold Corkin's talks incredibly tedious and dull and dreary. He isn't the best of speakers. There isn't much life in his delivery normally, making it hard to pay much attention to what he's saying. But it seems on this particular subject <laughs> of apostates, of the enemy... Suddenly, he becomes a little bit more energetic. There's a bit of life to him. There's a bit of spring in his step when he is spewing the black and white us versus them narrative of this group. It's all there on full display in Harold Corkin's morning worship cameo. A fine soldier, his main objective is to stay loyal to his commanding officers. And yet a fine soldier, his main objective is to stay loyal to his commanding officers 
and to those who are giving instructions. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, you're all soldiers. And what do soldiers do? They stay loyal. They follow orders. You should all be following orders and staying loyal to your commanding officers, the governing body. He even went on to have a pop at the appearance of apostates. Am I the only one who picked up on that? Today, there is a clear difference, isn't there, between the soldiers of Satan and the soldiers of Christ. Well, today, there is a clear difference, isn't there, between the soldiers of Satan and the soldiers of Christ. There's a sharp contrast in appearance, in attitude, in disposition, in motivation. Not just attitude and disposition and motivation and conduct, but appearance. They look different to us as well. That's how you can tell them apart from soldiers of Christ. If they're the enemy, if they're working for Satan, you're going to see it in their appearance. Apparently, if I cut my hair and had a shave and wore a suit, suddenly my videos would be acceptable viewing for Jehovah's Witnesses. And then he just unleashes with this perfect example of us versus them, black and white thinking. There can be no gray area here because it's black and white thinking. We're either on one side or the other, correct? And uh, there can be no gray area here. We're either on one side or the other, correct? You can't be on both sides. You're either for us or you're against us. You're either good or evil. You're either friend or foe, black and white. Us versus them. What about people who care about Jehovah's Witnesses, who don't mind so much Jehovah's Witnesses having their own beliefs and doing whatever they feel they need to do, following whatever belief system they wish to follow, just so long as people aren't getting hurt, just so long as there isn't abuse being either encouraged or covered up in some way. If you extol this black and white thinking that he is completely indulging in here, what room does that leave for whistleblowers? What room does that leave for people in a group where there is harm or there is evil or there is abuse to say, I don't agree with this. We need to change this. We need to do something about this. When you have this black and white, us versus them mentality, any form of whistleblowing becomes impossible and abuse can flourish. Well, we have this matter of unity, don't we? Shoulder to shoulder, side by side. And yet, one of the tactics of the devil is to get us divided and uh, disjointed and fighting among ourselves. To turn the enemy on itself is a very effective war strategy. Now, our brothers may disappoint us, they may frustrate us, they may hurt us at times due to imperfections, but they're not the enemy. The devil and his hordes, those are the enemies. So we don't get to fighting with the wrong person. Again, if you think about it, this leaves absolutely no room for people to raise legitimate concerns. Because if you register any form of criticism, you're automatically the enemy, or you're automatically trying to cause divisions. You're making Jehovah's Organization divided and disjointed. You're voicing unreasonable objections about the brothers taking the lead and their imperfections. This is classic manipulation from a group that are masters when it comes to crushing any form of dissent and any form of criticism. You're either for us or against us. You're either friend or foe. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you need to be a soldier. You need to follow orders and you need to respect your commanding officers, there is no room for anything else. Soon after the governing body released a revised English edition of the New World Translation, they decided to revise a Spanish edition. It eventually took four and a half years to complete. Why did it take so long? 
Apart from the translation process itself, the work was complicated by the wide geographic range of these Hispanic countries and their different cultures. This diversity meant that in different countries the same Spanish word could mean different things. In other cases, the word may be unknown in certain areas or even sound objectionable to some. To overcome these difficulties, the translators used 100 outside readers from many different countries to review the translated text progressively. These readers were of different ages, cultures and backgrounds. These outside readers regularly received chapters of the Bible electronically and then they introduced their suggested revisions. The translation teams took note of all their recommendations and in some cases they also sent them specific inquiries. Every verse was checked by 130 different people. So right at the Madrid International Convention, the governing body decided to release the Bible in digital format. This was several months before all the Bibles could be printed. The highlight of the Friday morning convention program was when Brother Lowe's presented the new revised Bible. But there was another surprise. Since at the convention, most brothers and sisters had their phones and tablets with them, they were able to immediately download the revised Bible. How was that possible? 500 portable Wi-Fi devices were distributed among each of the 11 convention venues in Spain that were tied in with the Madrid Stadium. During the lunch break on Friday, practically everyone in attendance could download the revised Spanish edition of the New World Translation. We laughed and cried with joy. We knew it was a gift from Jehovah, which he was given us at that moment. And also, we felt so happy because we'd been waiting a long time for it. What I most like about this revision is that it's very easy to understand. Sometimes I think, but was this what we had before? It seems that it reaches my heart much quicker. It kind of was what you had before, though, wasn't it? I'm sorry, I know some people will get all excited about the new Bible, the revised version. Obviously, the English revised version came out in 2013, and we're here being told about the Spanish version, which took a few more years to come up with. Look, I understand that language changes over time, and if you're going to make the Bible relatable, it helps if you have a version that is in step with how people are talking at that time. I just can't help, though, but keep thinking, but it's the Bible. It's supposed to be God's inspired word. What does it say about God's inspired word if it constantly needs to be changed and updated to keep pace with the way language changes over time? If you think about it, whenever the organisation is arguing for the authenticity of the Bible... They will point to the early scribes and the way they would painstakingly make copies of each book so that every single word was faithfully reproduced, so that there were no alterations. The way they argue it, and I'm not saying this is how it happened, but the way they argue it is, oh, from the moment it was first written by the original Bible writer, through decades or even centuries, it stayed the same because these scribes were so fastidious about keeping every single word faithful to the original. Apparently, now we're in the 21st century, that whole logic just flies out of the window and we can just produce new Bibles every decade or couple of decades to keep step with the language. And the problem I guess you have, I mean, you could say, well, this is just individual words to make sure that the individual words don't mean something different to how they're intended and don't raise cultural issues and that sort of thing. It's the individual words that this organisation fixates over. So you could, for example, switch a word to something less objectionable that has roughly the same meaning 
but where it also has other meanings so that when the brother giving the talk is quoting from the verse, he'll start going down this rabbit hole of what this exact word means and what its definition is and how it relates to any number of other things, most of which will probably have nothing to do with the original meaning or intention of the verse. Bottom line, if you're talking about almost any other book, you can make all sorts of excuses for changing the words and getting dozens of people to decide on what words should be used in a given section. They mention in the video that every verse was checked by 130 different people. If you think about it, this Bible has been written by potentially hundreds of people, each of whom have an opportunity, even if it's in the most subtle way, of just slightly changing a verse to mean something more in line with their ideas and their opinions. Again, if it's the Word of God, how do you explain this? How do you explain essentially translating and interpreting God's Word by committee every few years so that it's constantly changing. I also hope you noticed how, yet again, a mundane accomplishment is trumpeted as being evidence of God's blessing. We laughed and cried with joy. We knew it was a gift from Jehovah. We laughed and cried with joy. We knew it was a gift from Jehovah. Yes, it wasn't just the latest in a long line of Bible revisions and translations by a group known for twisting the Bible, twisting God's word to make it fit in with their narrative and their ideas. It can't just be an ordinary, unremarkable, easily anticipated human accomplishment by a man-made organisation with almost unlimited volunteer resources. No, no, it has to be a gift from Jehovah. To attend assemblies, the brothers have to cross a mountain range, a trip of about 125 miles or 200 kilometres. Sometimes snow and ice make the roads impassable. Our brothers are out in the ministry no matter what the weather has in store. In the winter, the sun doesn't rise high enough to be seen above the mountains in some parts of Ushuaia. When days are short, the brothers adapt and start preaching later to make the best use of sunlight. The brothers have organized a campaign to preach in rural communities and on remote islands, such as Navarino Island across the Beagle Channel. So we've just been watching part of the final segment of this month's broadcast and it's effectively a postcard from Tierra del Fuego, a group of islands off the southernmost tip of the South American mainland, a viciously cold part of the world, not that far off from Antarctica, where it's effectively winter all year round. And I don't think this segment has aged that well in terms of COVID. Perhaps I should explain that these JW Broadcasting episodes aren't just produced within the last few weeks or even the last couple of months. In my experience, or according to what I know, these episodes are produced at least six months in advance so that they can be processed by all the various audiovisual departments and all the different translation teams, Watchtower gives themselves a very long run-up between first producing these videos and then later releasing them. It seems to me that this and last month's JW Broadcasting episodes were produced either during or shortly before the COVID-19 pandemic took hold. And I think that sort of shows in places when it comes to the naivety and the lack of thought of how some of this information will age, given that, for example, now we have a situation where Jehovah's Witnesses aren't preaching, they're not attending Kingdom Hall meetings, they're not physically attending assemblies or conventions, they are mostly at home 
following their religion over Zoom. And this huge change in the way Jehovah's Witnesses worship is excused by the fact that, well, Satan's system has given us these rules and these regulations regarding COVID. We need to listen to Caesar when it comes to our health and our well-being. And in some countries where Caesar isn't putting forward these rules and regulations or isn't insisting that people go into lockdown, you should still follow these lockdown provisions so that you're attending your meetings and your assemblies from home and you're not going out into the territory to preach. Again, all of this is being done with the health and well-being of Jehovah's Witnesses in mind. And yet here you have a situation where witnesses living in Tierra del Fuego just a stone's throw away, effectively, from the Antarctic, are being lauded for going out into the territory in what I understand are permanent tundra conditions because they feel obligated to put their health on the line so that the organisation can attract more recruits. So my obvious question is, why the double standard? Why does the health of Jehovah's Witnesses matter during a pandemic so that witnesses need to stay inside and not go out preaching, but the health of witnesses in Tierra del Fuego, ah, we'll send them out for hours at a time in tundra conditions. Hey, at least they have their hats and scarves and gloves, and I know that's what many of you who might be Jehovah's Witnesses, will be saying, oh yes, well, they're wrapped up warm. As long as they're wrapped up warm, it'll be fine. No, I'm sorry, in these conditions, hats and scarves and gloves will get you to the shop and back again. It's one thing to wrap up warm when you're going somewhere or when you're returning home. It's another thing to have to spend hours in tundra conditions. And don't forget, when you call on someone's door in those conditions, the person who answers the door, they're not prepared for those conditions. They're not prepared to stand there with their door open, the heat escaping their home, and have a conversation on their doorstep that could last for, what, five, ten minutes? They're not wrapped up or anything. What are they supposed to do? So it's just, well, it's selfish, isn't it? It's, again, all about serving the organisation, regardless of the consequences, regardless of the individual sacrifice, regardless of the health of people. No, no, the organisation comes first. We need to think about bringing people into the organisation. But that's all I have to say about this month's JW Broadcasting episode. I hope you found some or all of my thoughts helpful. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.